This is Ken Pyle, and we're here at the IMN uh, Data Center Conference, and we're with Hunter Newby of Allied Fiber. Uh, they've got a really unique model. Hunter, why don't you take us through what you guys are doing? So thanks for having me on the, the show here. Um, so Allied Fiber is building a physical layer network neutral superstructure around the United States, essentially a ring uh, that connects the submarine cable landing regions. Um, so we have a pretty unique business model. We treat uh, fiber, dark fiber, as real estate. Uh, and every 60 miles, we have our own modular co-location building uh, made of precast concrete and steel. Um, it's modular, so it's, it's made in Shreveport, Louisiana. It's shipped, and they're installed and deployed every 60 miles. Uh, and then in between the, the colo facilities, we have access to the fiber cable through what's called a handhole which is a, basically a splice point. Um, and in Florida, they're approximately every 5,000 feet apart, the handholds. Uh, and then north of Jacksonville, they'll be about every 3,000 feet. We use railroad rights of way, all of our cables buried. Uh, we buy our fiber from Corning. Um, we've designed a very unique uh, 528 count uh, center core uh, stack of ribbons. Um, again, we're in the real estate business. We're provisioning individual fiber pairs for any and all network operators. We don't view carriers, uh, service providers, enterprises any differently. Uh, they're all network operators to us, and essentially we uh, charge them rent for space and power in the amplification facilities every 60 miles because long-haul fiber needs to have light that's amplified and regenerated. But what's different about what we're doing, aside from all those things that I just mentioned, is the fact that our colo facilities, um, which are traditionally op-amp regen facilities, we treat them as uh, carrier-neutral meet-me rooms or network neutral, which is a very sort of popular term today with net neutrality. So if a network operator can physically build into our system, whether through a handhold or directly into a colo, or connect to us in one of the major carrier hotels, sort of at the endpoints, uh, they're open to connect to anyone that they want. And they can do breakouts in our colo facilities and sub-rate out their core transport networks. Uh, so most of the network operators we're selling fiber to today are on a 20-year IRU basis and they're lighting up, for the most part, 100 gig DWDM uh, systems, multiple channels. So, so when they're doing this, is it generally are they leasing the whole fiber or, or do you lease some sub-channels as well? No, we don't do anything lit. We're not a carrier. We have no carrier licenses. Okay. We are strictly in the real estate business. Okay. So we're just creating physical infrastructure to enable all network operators to have and enjoy the benefits of having their own dark fiber network that they light. And some of them will resell lit services at the sub-rate level, wavelengths, Ethernet, what have you, or just IP, uh, Internet Protocol or Transit, private IP. But others are actually procuring the dark fiber to light it themselves for their own internal needs. Yeah. So they're taking their traffic off of the public Internet and away from other carriers uh, that they otherwise would have to buy wavelengths or, or transport services from. Yeah, and that's a huge problem for a lot of the rural areas where you have um, transit costs or costs to get to that last mile. Yeah to the internet is, is really expensive. It seems like that's one of the problems you potentially help solve, right? Yeah, that's, well, I, that was a big part of the design that I came up with for Allied Fiber. Um, so, you know, to think of intermediate splice points, physical access, you know, it's sort of like in a city, there's manholes. Mm -hmm. So on our route, there's handholes. And I view the United States and, and the major cities as sort of buildings in a city. And I view the handholes like manholes. And so uh, I think it's important to understand your background, if, if you can talk about that for a moment, because I think that you know, informs what you're doing now. Absolutely. So um, prior to starting Allied Fiber, um, I was involved in another venture called Telex, uh, which is a physical air network neutral interconnection business model. Uh, so I came up with the original business concept for physical air interconnection um, at 60 Hudson Street, you know, with a great team of people that I worked with back in those days. Uh, there were some interesting times in the late 90s and early 2000s when we were doing things that really no one understood. Um, but within a few short years, about four to five years, we reached critical mass in terms of the number of physical networks we had. I particularly went after the subsea systems. So I have a big sort of background in submarine cables and, you know, particularly the transatlantic, the North Atlantic stuff. Um, but it was network neutral interconnection, uh, bringing all these different networks into one room in a building uh, so that they had proximity to each other. And then a business model that I created with products and pricing and a layout for the room of how fiber would come in from outside and how it would run along a ladder rack and where it would terminate to a patch panel. And then we kept an inventory of every port on every panel from every network there. So at best, the carrier is going to know what it has. It would never know what anyone else had. So we knew what everyone had. Okay. So we were a facilitator of interconnections between and amongst European networks, Canadian networks, South American networks, all through the United States. So that the genesis of that, that concept, physical air network neutral interconnection, was born out of the need to eliminate local loops in a building. Mm -hmm. 
between two major carriers, which just didn't seem to make any sense to use a third party LEC to go between two floors in the same building. So I was an IXC at the time, and I decided that it made more sense for us to solve the physical air problem for ourselves first, cut out the loop. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that that would benefit all IXCs and PTTs and subsea cables and you name it, and it did. So the, the neutral interconnection business or the meet me room business model that we innovated and perfected at Telex is really what I've infused into the allied fiber colos. And what makes the colo relevant is that we own the fiber cable that connects the colos. Effectively, you've created a distributed version of what you created many years ago, right? Correct. It's a physically distributed meet me room around the entire United States that links the major carrier hotels and the subsea cable landing stations. Now you've uh, you've you've started. I guess uh, you've got Florida, the East Coast, kind of built up. But you obviously, as you've mentioned, you have plans for the the whole nation, right? Yeah. So we built from Miami to Jacksonville. That's done. There's a 528 count cable that's placed. We have six buildings in Florida, um, and we've tied into several cable landing stations in South Florida as well as the major carrier hotels. And we just recently announced uh, our build from Jacksonville to Atlanta is underway, and we should be in Atlanta by June. Okay. Yeah, and I think I saw that. What What do you anticipate as far as how long will it take to build out that that big loop, uh, that big ring? Time and money. So you know, if I had all the money today, it would still probably take five years to finish the whole thing, just from a an engineering perspective, and then doing the high railing on the railroads, and you know, securing rights to some places. And the we've secured. Yeah, we've secured the rights away with Norfolk Southern Railroad. So basically, from Jacksonville to New York and Chicago, and in uh, Florida, we use a different railroad, Florida East Coast. Um, and, you know, it's a big project. But let me tell you something. This country needs this badly. Well, um, and, yeah, and why don't you talk to kind of your thoughts on this whole, you know, quote unquote, net neutrality. And, and uh, I know you have some opinions on it. Sure. Well, net neutrality, what's sort of in the news today, um, this popular buzz term, is very much an affliction of uh, the consumer, the end user. Uh, and that's largely due to the fact that they're essentially held hostage by a last mile access provider, one or two, for example. And it's difficult because anybody that makes an investment in that physical access wants to get a return on that. And you know, I completely understand that, but it's an inhibitor to our GDP growth and productivity gains here in the United States, which other countries are enjoying, but those are much smaller countries than the United States. A lot of the Western European countries and some of the Asian nations, they have national fiber plans that were already deployed and they've had in place for years and others are underway and will be done soon. And we don't have a national network neutral integrated colo fiber plan except for allied fiber um, and it's because it's necessary so you know net neutrality really is about end users and the people that can't go build their own fiber to get to a meet point uh, but a lot of enterprise networks and of course all the MSOs and the wireless backhaul providers and the RLEX and the ILEX and so on munis they can they could do something about it they could build into the allied fiber system and once they get into one of our colos they're essentially free to connect to whomever they want to peer uh, by transport by transit subsea system you know, capacity, what have you. Uh, but net neutrality is really interesting because it accentuates the, the issue, which is control. Mm -hmm. It's all about control. So net neutrality is not internet neutrality. It's network neutrality. And the legal definition of the word network is very different than internet. And the reason why it's net neutrality is because it's about access to the internet, not the internet itself. So it's really interesting what a lot of these access providers are doing, charging the end user for access to the internet and then charging the content provider to get to the end user as well. And the reason why they can do that is because they have control. Well, and to your point, the more competition you have, whether it's the mid-mile or the last mile, right, that kind of becomes the self-regulating uh, force if you have it, right? Yeah, sure. I see Allied Fiber as sort of being the, the genesis for hundreds of new networks that will find regions where there's only one or two providers they'll be able to go build out. You know, triple play, MDU kind of fiber networks. We have several customers that do that today. Uh, Summit Broadband is one of them in Orlando, Florida area. They have a lot of triple play customers, lots, thousands of, of local broadband subscribers. And, you know, as a testament to what it is that we're doing to help enable their business, we put out a press release with them a few weeks ago um, where, you know, their CEO said that this is going to have a positive impact on thousands of their uh, local subscribers of broadband. Um, you know, this meaning allied fibers infrastructure and their ability to use us to get between markets in Florida that they currently don't even connect themselves. Right. That's, right. What, that's what we're for. We're the bridge that connects the islands. 
Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it, uh, I mean, that's been a, a, a problem since, you know, ever, whenever SMA TV or PC or private cable operators were invented, right? They couldn't connect those little islands. Um, and clearly, the more fiber you have out there, the better that is. Um, have you been talking to any of the kind of the regional fiber networks that, you know, I know a lot of the independent telcos and maybe small cable companies have put together consortiums that, not necessarily in the, you know, southeast, but in other parts of the country? Sure. Talk to all of them all the time. A lot of them reach out to us and they want to know when we're going to be in their state. Yeah. Like soon, like when soon, <laughs> tomorrow. They look at our map, a lot of times I get comments from people if there's a state that Allied Fiber hasn't planned a route through, they want to know why we're avoiding them. The truth of the matter is I pick railroad rights of way to connect the submarine cable landing regions and they just don't happen to be on a path to one of those. But that they can see our superstructure, it gives them a sense of where they are. And you know, it's kind of like being lost in the woods. Mm -hmm. Now they know which way to go. Yeah, sometimes it's outside of their jurisdiction, whether they're a county or a state, and they can't get past that line. They can't use their own funds to you know, build in another state or what have you. There are regional network operators uh, that, that do traverse some of those state lines. And if they could touch us in one or two places, uh, preferably, they would be able to serve whole regions of the U.S. and out of a couple of allied fiber neutral meet points. So again, distributing the meet me room around the United States and allowing them to tie in and then serve a whole whatever, a state or a region of states uh, that currently has no competitive access. Um, and then through our design, they can just tap in and out of our route along the way. Um, and we're contemplating building what we call the cross, which is to basically build a ring and then kind of split the middle oh, okay. so that break the country up into quadrants. Yeah. But again, that just adds more time and more right. capital. But it's hugely beneficial to everybody in the U.S. because there would be a physical air platform, you know, with 20-year agreements and whatnot. Right. And that would give people stability and predictability, which is really what they need. Yeah, and again, I mean, I could see uh, some great partnership opportunities with some of the folks out there in the, in the regional side. Have you, um, you know, from the, the, you know, you're creating these little uh, uh, modules, if you will, or these, these data centers where you're doing the optical amplification and the meet me. Um, what about the data center aspects? Can now a company can put their equipment in there and so forth, yeah. but is it mostly just for, uh, it's not actual data center type no. stuff? Yeah, Allied Fiber co-location facilities are not data centers. They're meet me rooms. And I'm very particular about my words. Right. Carrier hotels, meet me rooms are not data centers. Right. Sometimes there's data center space in a carrier hotel, but a data center is a data center, and it's not a carrier hotel, and it's not a meet me room. What's the distinct difference? The meet me room is basically where the, the greatest number of disparate physical fiber networks meet. And that's where the core transport exists. That's where you're going to find you know, the, the heavy 100 gig and, and now even terabit multi-channel DWDM systems and the big ethernet and the big routers, you're not going to find servers there. And that's why we build our buildings modularly. Mm -hmm. And they're meant to really be that multi-tenant, you know, neutral, uh, active, vibrant interconnection marketplace. What hangs off of that, and you can look on our, our website and you can see our system model, we call it the cartoon. There are modular and container data centers that can just plug right in like Legos. Okay. So we're not trying to sell anybody a data center product that they could easily go out and get from 40 different vendors in the market today. We're selling them physical access to the fiber. Yeah, no, that makes sense and that gives them uh, an on-ramp to everything else. Uh, yep. yep. So. Um, from a, you know, you mentioned it as a real estate, and we're here at a conference that really is viewing kind of this, the whole data center market and and maybe even telecom market kind of as a real estate play, yes. which is kind of a whole new mindset. Um, are those the kind of investors that you see kind of, you know, investing in your company? Um, well, our, our investors, yeah, the, the investors that we have are a lot of individuals that um, made money at Telex, quite frankly. So they understood the real estate business model of the neutral interconnection meet me room business from that. Uh, and of course, I have a relationship with them and so do some of my other, you know, board members and management team members. We were all part of that group. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they understand what we're doing. Uh, it's a large infrastructure project, right. you know, it's but get 20 year deals though. 20 year fiber I use that the, the networks pay us up front for the fiber mm -hmm. and then they pay us rent in the colos for 20 years. That's a great business. Yeah, no, it is. And so, it's, but it sounds like you're just really getting ramped up and yeah. going. Well, it's a big country. We have a lot to do. The cool thing about it, though, is that our model is very simple. It doesn't have a lot of moving parts. It's very replicable and it's very scalable. Excellent. Well, it sounds like uh, you've got a great opportunity and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate it.